Hello, everyone. I'd like to officially welcome you to today's webinar, Ready, Set, OSATS. I'm Khadija Carr from the AmeriCorps VISTA Marketing and Outreach Unit at the Corporation for National and Community Service here in Washington, D.C. Assisting me today off screen is Rachel Raddick and Jenny Farrell from Education Northwest in Portland, Oregon. You'll see Rachel and Jenny in the chat and the Q&A to assist you during today's session and to help get your questions answered. I'd like to welcome our main speaker today. Ryan Fewens Bliss is a National VISTA trainer with Education Northwest, CNCS's training partner. In his day job, he serves as the Deputy Director of Community and Partnership mobilization at the Michigan College Access Network. Ryan hails from Northern Michigan and graduated twice from Central Michigan University. For nearly a decade, he has served local, state, and national nonprofits and educational institutions as a consultant. Ryan has managed both AmeriCorps VISTA and AmeriCorps State Program and continues to work with AmeriCorps in his current role. Ryan has presented on the topic of on-site orientation and training, or OSOT, for both VISTA supervisors and members, and has a wealth of information on this essential topic. We are happy to have him answer your questions today. Again, my name is Khadija Carr, a suitability and screening specialist for VISTA and a proud VISTA alum serving from 2015 to 2016 in my hometown, Silver Spring, Maryland, with Community Preservation and Development Corporation. Throughout today's presentation, we will be sharing specific tools and resources to help support your work as a VISTA supervisor. These strategies and tools have been compiled into a document called Orienting Your VISTA. This list of tools and resources was included as a link in the webinar reminder email that you received. Don't worry, we will also post this document directly on the VISTA campus along with this webinar recording. All right, so you know a bit about us and where we are located, and now we want to know where you are currently located as a VISTA supervisor. To use the annotation, first click on the squiggly line icon in the pop-up tool panel on the left side of the slide to show the annotation toolbar. Then click on the arrow in the toolbar to activate and click under yes or no in response to the statement on the screen. If you are using a cell phone or tablet, the annotation function will not work. You can put your answer in the chat. All right, so I'm seeing... A few people are entering their responses. One person on the East Coast with me. All right. Two, three. Somebody in Louisiana. Ooh, ooh. Shout out. My grandfather's in Louisiana. <laughs> There's much more of you on in on this webinar. Where are you all? Looking like Nancy's in Florida. All right, Anthony in Maryland, Lisa in Kentucky. Awesome. So it's good to know we have so many people from all over. All right. So first off, I want to thank you all for sharing your on-site orientation and training questions during registration. We reviewed all of your responses and found four top questions or themes that seem to be on everyone's mind. So here they are. The first is, what does a VISTA need to know the first weeks? Second, how can the newly launched VMO 
connect to OSAP? Third, what are the best practices for facilitating transition? And finally, how do intermediaries ensure consistent on-site orientation and training across multiple sites? We've also reserved time during today's session as an opportunity for an open question and answer period to allow you to ask questions in real time around the topics not covered early in the webinar. I'm now going to turn it over to our presenter today, Ryan. Take it away. Thanks, Khadija. Before I share with you some key tips uh, to, uh, well, to share with your VISTA during those first few weeks, I want to hear from you. We know there's always more power in the room from folks who are embedded in the work. What information do you all share with your VISTA during the first few weeks? What strategies do you use to help them get off to a great start? We're going to use the chat to respond to this question, so please enter your ideas in the chat box and make sure you send that chat to all participants. That way everyone can see what you're writing. We want comments to be visible to all, all people. Uh, and be sure to enter them in the chat panel and not in the Q&A panel further down the screen. That one messed me up a, a couple of minutes ago. I couldn't find the chat panel. So make sure you find that right chat panel and not the Q&A. And again, if you're on a mobile device, you'll find that chat feature at the bottom of the participant panel. All right, let's see what you have to say about those first few weeks. Anthony says orientation and handbook. Yeah, the handbook's a great thing to give out right away, maybe even that first day. Nancy says organization history, mission, and vision. Yep, you want to make sure they know what the organization they're serving for and what you're all about. Deanna says share organizational and project information, meet with key staff, board members, and partners. Yep, that's great, Deanna. We're going to talk about a few of those things together, actually. Holly says she too sets up meetings with other staff who our VISTA will have to work with across the agency. Yeah, I think that's just super critical. Oh, I love Aisha, or Ashaya, sorry if I'm, I'm murdering your name there. Uh, walking tour of the city by VISTA leader to meet with key staff. Very cool, especially for VISTAs who aren't serving in their home community. Tim has his VISTAs do an elevator speech, that's great. Those VISTAs that go to an in-person PSO also do that there, so that's really helpful. John says tours of facilities, shadowing employees to learn day-to-day -day operations. I love that too, John. These are really, really great suggestions. Philip says he does a scavenger hunt. That's cool, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. A welcome packet. Yeah, I love when VISTAs feel like they're welcomed, you're ready for them that they're not showing up and it's like, oh, that's right, VISTAs are starting today, welcome. <laughs> it's great to have things prepared and make them feel like they are prepared. These are really great, thanks for your thoughts. Let's dig into the webinar content uh, that mirrors some of what you have already said here. So again, we're talking about what must our new VISTA know during those first few weeks. And as you heard from my introduction, I've been a VISTA program manager in the past, as well as a VISTA supervisor. So I spent a lot of time thinking about on-site orientation, orientation and training, or OSAT. I feel like it's one of those places in which my program excelled. We had lots of work to do, but this is a place I think we did it really well. So I'm really happy to answer your questions uh, later today. Let's begin by giving you a couple of my own strategies for the first week of onboarding a new VISTA. While every site's obviously going to be a little bit different, there are some universal topics that are helpful to consider. It's important to remember that OSA is more than likely the VISTA member's first introduction to your organization and their assignment, just as many of you mentioned in the chat a moment ago. So you want to make sure that what you cover is enough for them to hit the ground running. Information we've heard is power. The more information that the VISTA member has, the more likely the member's going to be able to perform the activities necessary to reach those project goals and address the community needs. But at the same time, you don't want to overwhelm the member with too many facts and details. Only what he or she will really need to get started. Training and learning is an expectation of the entire year, not just prior to and during the OSAT. So we're playing the long game here. So prior to the VISTA starting, I recommend giving them key workplace logistics. You mentioned some of these in the chat. What date and time to arrive, as simple as that seems. What specific location if you've got more than one site? Where to go for parking, transportation if there's bus routes or biking routes. 
Uh, a big one for me and my VISTA program was the dress code. What is the expectation around what the VISTA wears every day? And providing your VISTA all this information up front and a detailed OSAT schedule before day one, uh, like you see the sample on the screen actually, is really, really helpful. Again, it shows that you're prepared for them uh, and that they can prepare for you. So once your VISTA arrives, uh, you can provide additional workplace logistics from the simple things like how to work the copy machine and where the bathrooms are to the more complex. What do we do if there's an emergency? Or are there specifics around grant provisions for how you act and, and operate? You'll want to make sure some of those things that you now take for granted are well articulated from the get-go, things that you're used to but a new person wouldn't know. That includes things like calendars and scheduling too, as each office seems to do calendaring a little differently, but it's really an essential part of any office operating fluidly. So you wanna make sure you give the VISTAs the rundown. A helpful resource for that first week is the getting started section of the OSAT checklist found on the VISTA campus. If you're like me, having a box to check off helps keep me organized and on track. So you can click on that after the webinar and check it out. Next, it's important to orient your VISTA to workplace relationships. Several of you mentioned this in the chat as well. So key relationship is obviously your relationship as a supervisor with the VISTA. So whenever I train VISTAs or supervisors, I try to talk a lot about this relationship between the two and how, from my experience, this can really make or break a year of service for both of you. One of the best pieces of advice I have is to start working on that relationship immediately. Day one of arrival, maybe even sooner, and to talk about the relationship openly, and that can feel a little awkward, but talking about how we want to work together, how, what helps you be successful, uh, how do you like to receive feedback, what's one thing I can do to really help you. It may seem a little touchy-feely at first, which is not my jam, but you'll be happy you put this stuff on the table now when things are pleasant rather than when something happens later in the year and there's more tension. If possible, I really think you should take your VISTA to lunch during that first week, maybe even invite other staff members, uh, make it part of that OSAT schedule. Other people and relationships as well. So just as the relationship between you and your VISTA is important, the people and relationships within your office matter. Again, several of you mentioned this in the chat. So helping your VISTA navigate who's who and what relationships exist is really helpful intel that allows your VISTA to move faster, uh, excuse me, move farther faster. Uh, I'm certainly not talking about gossip, right? We're not talking about that. Like, is this person dating that person? This person hates that person. But describing who the players are internally and externally will give your VISTA more tools to get started. Who's your board chair? Does he or she come into the office? What's the level of formality when interacting with board members? Who are some of those key partners and how do you work with them? That's essentially uh, important for partners in which your VISTA will be engaged. We heard that again in the chat. Make sure your VISTA is given time their first week to walk around and talk to those staff members, start creating their own relationships with those staff members. Uh, someone mentioned creating a scavenger hunt as part of your first week of OSA. All of that fits in really well here. And then finally, the VAT. The VAD is in bold for a reason. Uh, I'm sure you all can guess why. It is probably the most important part of your VISTA's first weeks and arguably even their entire year of service. Add a meeting about the VAD to your OSAT schedule on day one. Most of your OSAT honestly should center on the VAD and its relationship to the community and your organization. So things like what skills does your VISTA already have in order to accomplish the VAD? What skills will he or she need to develop in order to accomplish the VAD? What projects are high priority and should start immediately and what projects don't occur until later in the year? Starting those conversations now is important. I often recommend and I highly recommend spending time your first couple of weeks mapping the VAD out in its entirety with your VISTA. It really gives them a pathway for success and tells them where they should spend their time and energy. This also frees you up from giving daily instructions on what the VISTA should be doing for those eight hours. Instead, you may be able to check in less frequently as the year goes on, since your VISTA knows the expectations of what you're trying to accomplish and has known them from the beginning. 
There's a couple, several, in fact, on-demand webinars available that include some deeper discussions about this issue. I'd encourage you to check them out uh, on the VISTA campus as well. So that really wraps up our discussion on the first few weeks. Hopefully that answered some of your questions. Our next question centered on the new VMO, the virtual member orientation. But before we dig in, I'd like to get a sense of how you all would rate your understanding of the virtual member organization or VMO. So we are doing a poll question. You see that poll question there on the right side of your screen. If you could please respond. How you'd rate your understanding of VMO. Are you a VMO pro? Are you pretty good with VMO? Do you have a fair understanding or VM what? That's answer D. Hopefully uh, you have a working understanding, but I know this feels really new to folks. So we'd love to know how you're feeling about it. All right. Let's close that poll and see where we're at with everyone before we jump in and start talking about BMO. All right, I can see the smoke coming out of my computer. That means it's tabulating and will be able to tell us some answers about what our collective understanding of VMO is. All right, so uh, yeah, so the poll results say that most of you have a fair to no understanding of VMO. Some of you have a pretty good understanding. Just two of you are v VMO pros, so congrats on that. I'm not surprised at all uh, by these by these responses. This seems really, really new and we're just getting into it. We've only run a few classes uh, and classes probably aren't even the, the right word. We've only run a few sessions of VMO since February. So good, we're gonna talk more about it today to help expand that uh, understanding. So the VMO or the virtual member orientation is the corporation's new online form of pre-service orientation that was launched, as I mentioned, just in February. This is how VISTAs will receive their pre-service orientation moving forward uh, starting uh, next month, in fact. VISTA candidates who are enrolled in VMO will complete part of the orientation prior to service, including two live webinar sessions, and will then have recommended coursework that they should take or complete within that first two weeks of service. The coursework recommended for their first weeks of service is really designed to dovetail with your OSAT. What's great about OSAT is you're really the one in the, or excuse me, what's great about VMO is you're really the one in the driver's seat as you'll determine what they experience as part of that orientation. The coursework that the corporation recommends is meant to help you and your VISTA member learn about the VISTA program, the community they'll be serving in, and the VISTA assignment in general. This allows you to ensure a smooth transition into OSAT as you can build both VMO and OSAT to strongly connect. Uh, you can check out a webinar called Virtual Member Orientation on the VISTA campus that was given earlier this year for a great overview of this new orientation process. I wasn't part of that webinar, but I went back and listened to it myself for a better understanding of what VMO is. So I really recommend that. Uh, speaking of the VISTA campus, there's some great resources there that you can access to support the connection between VMO and OSAT. There's a whole VMO page designed especially for folks like you, supervisors, and a page for VISTAs that includes all of the materials that are, that's necessary. I found it to be really helpful to familiarize myself with the materials that the corporation provides to VISTAs as part of their orientation because I, find, I found that the VISTAs undoubtedly refer to those materials or those activities during their year of service. And I really hate the feeling and looking like I don't know what's going on. So I try to carve out 30 to 60 minutes to give it all a review whenever the corporation rolls something new out so I know what I'm talking about and can help the, the VISTAs navigate that as well. It should be time well spent. One of the things I'm most proud about myself is that I tend to be pretty self-aware and that self-awareness is telling me right now that I've been speaking for you probably a little too long. So let's hear a new voice for a few minutes. Khadija, can you help give participants a break from my voice for a few minutes? <laughs> uh, you have a wonderful voice, Ryan, uh, but okay. Before I move us into more questions, 
I want to remind our audience that for more in-depth information on the VMO, to take some time to watch the webinar, Virtual Member Orientation, a new way of preparing VISTA members for service. This webinar pro provides great info about how the Virtual Member Orientation works and the role of VISTA supervisors in supporting their candidates who participate in it. All right, so now that we've gone over the first two big questions you submitted to us during registration, what other questions do you have on these specific topics, specifically the first few weeks of service and VMO? And if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. You'll be prompted to record your name. To withdraw your request, please press star 2. One moment, please, to see if we have any questions or comments. The chat is escaping me. All right, it's back. Let's see. How to avoid information overload in one week, or in week one, rather. Are any sites incorporating group discussion into the VMO process? Hmm. Keep this question coming. So Ryan, can you tell us a little bit about uh, sites incorporating group discussions into the VMO process? I'm wondering if that's across sites even or groups of supervisors? No, I really can't. I think that's a good idea. I have not heard of any other sites doing that. I think it makes a ton of sense. I think Lynette is the one who said, uh, I hope you're doing that, Lynette. I think that's great. I think where you have a core of VISTAs, the more you can work with them together in the VMO and the OSAP process, the better their experience is. So many VISTAs feel like they're alone in the world, alone in their service, alone in the middle of their year of service. So the more you build a core feeling, a supportive network, I think that's great. And the more that they can have sort of a collective understanding of the issue that you're dealing with really helps you move faster as a supervisor throughout the year because you've given them sort of a foundation to work with and you know it's universal. So I think that's a great idea, Lynette. Let's see what else. What value gained at PSO is missed with a VMO? What can sites do to help compensate for what is lost during an in-person PSO? Christy, I've got so much to say about that. That's a great question. Uh, I've reflected on this uh, for a while, and I think really all of the content in the training that's provided at uh, PSO in the classic form, the traditional form, can certainly be replicated at home. It might not be easy to do so, uh, but it certainly could be. I think the piece that we're all going to have to work on building and ensuring stays is this connection to the bigger movement. So when VISTAs go off to PSO, they're with 200 or 300 other people, and there's just a lot of passion there, a lot of excitement, a lot of idealism, and they see that they're part of something bigger, something national, uh, and especially for young people, we see the research coming out now about them right now, that's what they want to feel. They want to feel like they're part of changing the world. They want to feel like they're part of a movement. So that's the piece that I think is going to be incumbent upon all of us to infuse with them? How can we plug them into other VISTAs serving in their region or in their state? How can we plug them into other national service programs, NCCC members and AmeriCorps state national members and senior corps members all across the community in which they're serving so they can see they're part of something bigger? Encouraging them to participate in webinars and trainings where they can see that there's hundreds of people participating I think is really helpful if we've got professional development funds to send them to the national conference every year. I think that's also a great way to get them plugged in. Uh, I think that's the piece that we're really going to have to work on. How do we make them understand that they're part of something big and bigger than them and be proud of that? Hmm. 
see. Let's see. One more question, and it is how to integrate a new VISTA member into an existing group of three VISTA members who all started service together? Great question, Lisa. I think that's a legitimate concern. Whenever I added a VISTA late, and it certainly happened probably once a year in my program, we did some very specific team building and social programming to help them get to know each other. And frankly, I had a talk with the existing VISTAs to say, listen, you guys have formed a really cool uh, cohort here. I've helped foster that cohort but we need to make sure we welcome this person in and you build your own individual relationships with this person as well as welcome them into your sort of cool club. Uh, so putting them on notice that part of this is their responsibility as well. And then constantly monitoring the situation, checking in with all of the VISTAs. Hey, new VISTA, how are you fitting in? Hey, uh, old VISTAs, how is this person fitting in? Have you created some relationships? And so there's a little bit of, uh, you know, sort of social manipulation, I guess. Maybe that's not the best uh, term for it. But I sort of picture you as a supervisor being the puppeteer trying to help and make sure those vistas are connected and stay connected. But, of course, in a genuine way. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think at this point we're going to transition over and shift to talking about vista transition and how intermediaries can ensure consistency across sites. Please continue to post questions to the Q&A. Um, and Ryan, let's get back to you. Cool. Well, I'm going to turn it right back over to the participants because I like to hear from you as well. We're <laughs> going to open a new poll. In fact, it's open now on the right hand of your screen. How would you describe your experience transitioning between VISTAs? Uh, that is when one VISTA is ending their year of service and another one is starting theirs on the same project. So if you could answer the poll on the right side of your screen. So your options are A, uh, has your experience been smooth? That usually means you have a clear process in place. VISTAs are able to transition successfully and the project is able to remain functioning and strong. Option B is bumpy. We have some experience, some confusion. I certainly have experienced some confusion in the VISTA transition. Uh, and then option C is unclear. Maybe you haven't had to transition between VISTAs before. Uh, so go ahead and take a moment to respond on the right hand of your screen. Transitioning is obviously really critical. I have also found that this to be an issue that can really go well or really go south quickly. And unfortunately for you supervisors, it usually is on your shoulders to make sure that the transition goes smoothly. So uh, taking responsibility for that is helpful. But I know as a former supervisor, you're trying to do things uh, quickly and be capacity builder yourself in your own organization. And this is the type of thing that can fall through the cracks. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So let's see the results here. Uh, most of you, it's been unclear. Option C, you've never had to transition between VISTAs. That's great. That means that uh, these hot tips that I'm about to give you will be helpful, uh, or hopefully will be helpful, when you first have to transition. And then we've got pretty much an even mix between smooth and bumpy, and that's not a surprise either. In my own project, I would say some years it was smooth and some years it was bumpy, and so uh, I've had it both ways, certainly. Well, let's dig in and talk about what those best practices for facilitating transition between VISTAs are. Thanks to everyone who answered the poll there. This topic uh, certainly spoke to me as I was uh, reviewing your questions that you submitted in registration. I saw it pop up as a common theme in lots of your questions. I often felt that just as I was enjoying the service of a well-trained and well-performing VISTA, the natural end of the service year came upon me. <laughs> Such, I guess, is the cyclical life of a VISTA project. Luckily, the great accomplishments of our VISTAs make this a really traversable bump in the road. In general, the VISTA should be transferring more capacity over the course of their year of service and the project should be transferring more capacity over the course of the grant period. You've heard the corporation talk about that over and over and over again. It's sort of a hallmark of the VISTA resource. We could do a whole webinar, though, on that topic alone, so I don't want to dive too deep into that now. 
But if you've got questions or thoughts on that process, don't hesitate to ask in the chat box or during our Q&A. For today's topic, let's just focus on how to transition between VISTAs as part of OSA. The first part of establishing a good transition is ensuring your outgoing VISTA has a strong closeout to their year. This means a couple of things. First, the outgoing VISTA should notify volunteers and partners and other important constituencies that their year of service is coming to a close. If there's no gap between the VISTAs, they should communicate as much as possible about that transition to these partners, something like, my year of service ends on August 30th. The new VISTA, Jane Smith, will start on September 1, and my supervisor, John, will be sure to introduce you during Jane's on-site orientation and training. So very direct, very specific. But if there's a gap between VISTAs, meaning that the new VISTA won't start immediately after the outgoing VISTA leaves, which is often commonplace, then the communication probably needs to be a little bit more vague, but the communication still needs to occur. Maybe something like my year of service ends on August 30th, the new VISTA is scheduled to be onboarded on October 1, look for more communication as that date gets closer. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please contact my supervisor, John. So the very crux of this is the need for that outgoing VISTA to transition those relationships to you or others as appropriate so no one's left hanging at their relationship with your organization and the project. No one's left hanging uh, with your organization since they've built that relationship. Second, you wanna make sure you've instructed your outgoing VISTA to document important information. I think we all do that. And that you've allowed them the time in those closing weeks to do so. Maybe we don't all allow them to do that. That's a key piece of this. This includes things like passwords to systems and websites and key upcoming dates and activities and other items that you or the new VISTA will need to know. I found that this is best done in list form so people actually use the information. Large paragraphs of text seem to dissuade supervisors and new VISTAs from reading as it feels like they don't have the time to read a novel. Third, it's really helpful during OSAT to have some sort of one-stop shop to refer incoming VISTAs to in order to find information like we just discussed. In my VISTA program, we use what we call a legacy binder to achieve this. So every outgoing VISTA had to create a legacy binder. It had key information, transition notes, files from their projects, in their events, et cetera. Uh, that they would then bequeath to the new VISTA, who would in turn do the same at the end of his or her service year. Uh, it makes it so much easier than scrambling to find the password list over here and then searching for the schedule of social media posts over there, uh, and then calling the previous VISTA to find out where she left the file for your major event. Instead, you've got it all in one place to find it all. VISTA Campus has a really great resource I'd recommend that you can give to members that, are, that will help them guide them on this uh, topic, on creating an exit binder that they can pass along to the new VISTA. Lastly, if you've got an outgoing VISTA who is tech savvy, I recommend encouraging them to use multimedia to facilitate that transition. So can they make a quick YouTube video to instruct the new VISTA how to do a task or how to provide nuance to a relationship that can't be well communicated in text in the legacy binder? Hopefully your outgoing VISTA is able to be reached by phone or email should you need him or her, but I know we all really try to keep that to a minimum not to hassle to, so we don't hassle people. In recent times when people need to know how to do something, you know, they just Google it, right? And they land on a video that quickly instructs them on how to do what they're looking to do on that topic. So your incoming VISTA is probably used to giving that type of support or getting that type of support. Continuing on with this topic, in order to facilitate transition, you should be as familiar as possible with where your VISTA left off. This was a place where I often made mistakes. When you have a really strong and independent VISTA, it can be tough because you've been able to really rely on them to be self-sufficient. I've been able to do that several times in supervising VISTAs. But really it's critical that as the new VISTA comes on board that you can give them the direction on where to begin. In order for you to do that, you've gotta know how the project has progressed and where the project left off. This will almost certainly connect to your conversations in OSAT about achieving the projects that are laid out in the VAD. 
finally, all of this end of service items that we've just been discussing can and should be used then as part of the new VISTAs OSAT. That's why we're talking about it right now in part of an OSAT webinar. Use those materials as the part of the closeout as part of the OSAT on the next VISTAs year. You can show your VISTA some of the new, excuse me, you can show your new VISTA some of the previous VISTAs end of year correspondence, uh, the things we were just talking about sending out to partners and volunteers. It's really helpful for someone I found to actually see the transition messages so they know what was said and they can get a sense of the tone in working with your partners. Uh, you should use that legacy binder in any multimedia created as part of OSAP, but I really recommend not just handing it to your VISTA and asking them to read it. That can be overwhelming. Several of you asked the question of how not to be overwhelming in week one. Here's a way not to be overwhelming. Don't just hand them the binder and say, hey, put your feet up at your desk and these first eight hours you can read this material. Uh, and it really lacks context when you do that. And, and they, they just won't know what to do with that information this early in their year. Where you can weave those pieces uh, from the legacy binder throughout the OSAT at appropriate times makes that information much more digestible and gives it that context that it needs in order to ensure uh, understanding and recall. The key to all of this is, excuse me, the key to all of this is that this is not the OSAT in itself. It is added material and context to the OSAT you've designed and you're providing. Nothing instills more disenchantment I found with a VISTA than being told to just read over what the person before you did, and that should get you started in your new role. On the flip side, an OSAC cannot really be effective if there's absolutely no materials from the previous year or years uh, on the project that your VISTA will be working on. All right, let's check back in with Khadija now that we're done talking about transition and do another chat question. Back to you, so Kadeesh, are you there? All right, so let's wrap up our discussion by talking about intermediary VISTA projects and their subsites. Our final question from supervisors is, how do intermediaries ensure consistent OSAT for the VISTA members on their project? Uh, first, I'd like to hear from the intermediary supervisors that are participating today. Um, you, you all have, of course, great experience at managing multiple sites, but what tips do you have for ensuring that there is consistent experience among VISTA members for OSAT across all of your sites? Make sure that you enter your ideas in the chat panel and be, share, be sure to share them with everyone. The first day of service is an orientation at our site. Then they report to the subsite on their second day. Someone's asking a question, how do I get access to monthly reports and end reports? Looks like Megan does something similar to Blaine, but their subsite orientations vary greatly. Hmm. OSATs are sent to our site before finalization for review and orientation held on the first day at our site as well. All right. Will says that they use a new VISTA checklist for all subsites. Khadija, I know there was a question asked about monthly reports and end reports. I don't want to leave that hanging out there, but I, I need a little bit more context uh, in order to answer that question. So I think that was Francis. Francis, if you yeah, want to clarify great. that more, we can we can address that uh, in our closing q and I just didn't want you to feel like we were leaving that hanging out there. Sorry, Khadija, go ahead. No, no worries. Looks like Corey is saying that they have the subsites send in their orientation materials to be reviewed. Three days of the first week, we do a group or team orientation for the whole team together. All 
right, seeing no more. Ryan, do you do you have anything to add to these to this topic? These are some really good ideas so far that I'm seeing. Yeah, some of these I'm going to hit on just briefly uh, because uh, you guys are hitting the nail on the head. These are great suggestions. The project in which I served was an intermediary, so I have a lot to say on this, but I also want to speed through to get us to our Q&A, which I know lots of you are waiting for. So forgive me if I pick up my pace just a little bit. So thanks to those who, who shared in the chat there. We appreciate that. So the organization in which I worked for and ran the VISTA project over several years was a multi-site intermediary, meaning the corporation gave my organization a grant and an allotment of VISTA slots. And then we sub-granted those VISTA slots out to other organizations to work toward the goals and the outcomes of our approved grants. I know you all know how that, how that goes. While everyone had to follow VISTA and corporation rules and policy, really at the end of the day, my organization, the intermediary, was who was responsible to the corporation. The most basic way to ensure consistency is to discuss these expectations up front. I saw a few people mention something to this effect in the chat. This can be instructions from an intermediary to subsites, or it can be a discussion and negotiation back and forth to, dis to excuse me, to determine who will cover uh, what material as part of their OSAT. Both intermediaries and subsites should provide some level of OSAT. What that looks like and how it's delivered is really up for determination by the intermediary because, again, they're the ones responsible to the corporation. For instance, in my project, all this was spent three to five days with me and my staff as the intermediary before being dispatched to each subsite, where they were then given a shorter but much more localized OSAT. Several of you mentioned this concept also in the chat. The reason this worked really well was, number one, we had funding to pay for a multi-day overnight training and because all subsites were basically doing the same type of service. So we could speak to those activities at the macro level. In many intermediary subsite programs, the activities aren't as universal site by site, so more of the OSAT would need to be at the subsite level rather than the intermediary level. Whatever you decide, I encourage you to document in the decision for both parties to refer to. I personally use memoranda of understanding MOUs with my subsites, where both the intermediary and the subsite signed a basically a legal document agreeing for how to do OSA and how it would be handled. Again, not everyone needs to be maybe that formal, but I do encourage the agreement on uh, how OSA and perhaps other issues like reporting maybe are going to be handled by each entity. As I mentioned already, every intermediary should provide some level of OSA. It could be a conference call, it could be a webinar, it could be an in-person meeting or whatever you think is appropriate, but it should exist in some form. They need to know who you are as an intermediary organization. I recommend project-wide OSAT by intermediaries. What are the universal tenets, activities, and expectations that all VISTA, that all subsites will be required to understand? Will there be project-wide events or activities or trainings in which all VISTAs will participate? Are there reporting templates or guidelines that all will be expected to adhere to? Uh, what policies will VISTAs be expected to abide by? At the very least, an intermediary should introduce itself as an organization and describe the larger VISTA project and the vision in which they're trying to achieve. I often facilitated a training on definitions and specifics about the issue in which my VISTAs were serving so that as they dissipated to their local sites, they were all operating with a universal language about the service. Subsites, on the other hand, should provide very site-specific information as part of their OSAT. The key items that VISTAs should know in their first couple of weeks and the facilitation of the successful transition specifically are good examples of topics we've already discussed today that probably relate more to a subsite's OSAT than an intermediary's OSAT. I really tend to think of the distinction between the intermediary and the subsite OSAT to be one of philosophy versus practicality. Now, I'm not naive enough to say that that's a universal rule, as I'm sure many of you could give me examples where that's not the case, but I think in general, the intermediary is providing a high-level concept of what we're all trying to achieve and why we're trying to achieve it, and then the subsite is providing practical orientation and training on what that looks like on the ground and how it happens. Finally, I really encourage the intermediary and the subsite to utilize site visits and check-in calls to ensure everyone's on the same page and that everyone has provided the appropriate OSAT that they were supposed to provide. As an intermediary, I conducted two site visits a year to each subsite to ensure everything was working the way it was supposed to. And don't think of these as compliance visits. 
as they weren't punitive in nature. They were more about the quality assurance and to make sure I had done all I was supposed to do to get the site set up for success. So while my program was very structured, I do recommend to all multi-site programs to create policies and systems and forms and agreements so that everyone knows their, their expectations from the beginning. If there's any confusion, it can be discussed prior to problems arising, just like that relationship between you and your VISTA. You wanna do more proactive than reactive. Uh, the more you can design your projects to be clear and manageable to everyone, the fewer problems you're going to have throughout the year. And where problems do occur, you have systems that are ready for everyone, uh, ready that everyone already understands to help you solve that problem. One last bonus tip for the subsite supervisors on the call, be sure to discuss these things with your intermediary. If things aren't currently clear or clearly delineated, you should reach out to your intermediary sponsor to discuss how this work can be better managed moving forward. So I told you I was gonna speed through that because I know by now you must be ready to ask some questions. So I really appreciate your attention on uh, the materials that we called from your registration questions, the four themes that we were able to pull out. I'm gonna turn it back over to Khadija again. I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna give you a chance to ask some questions and hopefully help you out. Hey Khadija, you wanna ask some questions or field some questions? Sure, so thanks Ryan. Um, you know, now that we've gone over some of the main questions, of course, that you've submitted during registration about reporting, what other questions do you all have? At this time, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A panel. I'm also going to invite our operator back on the line to give us uh, the instructions about how to ask a question via phone. Thank you. And again, as a reminder, if you do have any questions or comments, Please press star one and record your name. Again, please press star one. All right, let's see what we've got. Is it appropriate to invite a VISTA to an outside social event, like a barbecue or a birthday party? Ooh, can I field that one? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I think not only is it appropriate, I would recommend it. You may have some policies about how management and workers sort of interact, and obviously you should follow any of those policies for socializing outside of the workplace that your workplace has. But in general, I think bringing VISTAs into the team, making them feel like they're part of the team, and not just this temporary resource that frankly they are, helps engender more buy-in from them and helps them feel like part of the team so that they're ready and willing to jump into the service and sometimes take one for the team where that's required uh, in your office. So I tried to invite my VISTAs to lunch. I invited them over to my house to meet my family for dinner. Since they're not making tons of money, I tried to make them dinner sometimes. Whatever I could do to make them feel appreciated because uh, their service was so helpful to our community. Let's see what else we've got. How do you build a strong VMO? Oops, the poll is taking over my Q&A. One second. How do you build a strong VMO experience when you may have only one or two VISTAs? And also, the follow-up question is, how do you build those VISTA relationships the PSO had? I think those are really great questions, and you're, you may not like my answers, but it's sort of on our shoulders at this point. Uh, the corporation, in not offering the traditional PSO anymore, has, while they might articulate it this way, certainly is pushing to us the responsibility uh, to ensure that this experience is great. And so uh, I don't run a VISTA program anymore, but ha if I did at this point, I would be doing a whole lot more programming as part of OSAT, a whole lot more excitement, more of a national scope, a statewide scope to make sure folks can get plugged in and see the bigger picture. Uh, it just would be more incumbent upon me and is in fact more incumbent upon you all to do that uh, now. What was the second part of that question, Khadija? Sure, it's how do you build those VISTA relationships that the PSO had? Yeah, so it this again depends on the type of organization you are. If you have the ability to convene regional VISTAs at your office, and maybe it's just for like a national service lunch, maybe a 
you know, bring your own bag to lunch and able to convene multiple national service uh, programs and streams together. That's what I would do uh, if I was in your shoes to help make those connections, to try to recreate what was created at PSO, but probably on a community-wide or regional level. Uh, not every organization has the ability to do that or the space to do that, so hopefully someone in your community could step up. And I don't think that precludes you from poking somebody to do so. If you've got a United Way or a community foundation or a national service incubator, someone whose role really is to help be a leader in this area, I would give them a call up and say, listen, here's what we think we're missing from losing PSO, is this a role you can play sort of on a mini level, two times a year or quarterly, gathering all the national service members together in a room to just talk and connect? I think that's the, the way I would go. There's no other way to recreate the connections, frankly, if you don't get them together in person. The sort of plan B to that is on the VISTA campus. I think you all have seen the map where VISTAs and VISTA supervisors and VISTA alums can sort of put a pin where they serve and can be available for connections for other people in their area or in their issue. Having your VISTAs be prominent on that map and be open uh, to receiving information from others or questions from others and feel uh, safe and okay to reach out to other people to ask them questions. So that would be sort of my plan B is the VISTA campus map. Hopefully that helps. All right, let's Real quick, see. operator, are there any calls coming in or questions coming in? I show no audio questions. Okay, just to remind folks that you can uh, press star one if you want to call and ask a question verbally. Khadija, are there additional questions in our chat or Q&A? I'm seeing maybe a couple more. Here's one. It says, please explain the definition of direct service since VISTAs cannot provide direct service. You want me to take that one, Khadija? Yeah. So direct service is that service that's one-to-one -one with the end client. So that would be things like tutoring and mentoring. It could also be things like raking leaves at the elderly facility where the end recipient of the service is having direct contact with uh, the VISTA. I like to use the term indirect service. In fact, I just did a PSO here in North Dakota, and that's how I described capacity building and community empowerment as indirect service. Words such as coordinating, managing, uh, streamlining, designing, mobilizing, those are all capacity building indirect service words. But where VISTAs are directly serving clients, whether that's students or individuals who are homeless or trees or <laughs> rocks if you're in an environmental program, those are inappropriate uh, uses of the VISTA resource. Those are direct service uh, activities. I hope that made that clearer. Yes, I think we have time for one more question. And we have um, Margie Ryan who asked, you know, in those first few days or first couple weeks of OSOT, if there are signs that the VISTA is not working out, um, what could the supervisors do? Yeah, Margie, I appreciate your little emoji smiley face there. I certainly had my experience with VISTAs who uh, weren't working out, and you should have some sort of policy and some sort of plan in place in paper that's provided to the VISTAs up front so they know what that process looks like. Once you've gone through all of your stages of uh, corrective action, that's when you need to call your corporation state office and specifically your program officer and your corporation state office. Uh, VISTA projects, people like you and me are not allowed to terminate VISTAs. VISTAs don't technically work for us. We're not allowed to terminate VISTAs without approval from the state office. So don't ever do that. Uh, you want to make sure you talk to your state office. If the offense is particularly egregious and people are unsafe or it's a violation of the law or something like that, you certainly can send the VISTA home. You can't terminate them unless you have permission from the corporation. So whenever I got to the point where I was like, this just is not working out, I would pick up the phone and I would call the Michigan State uh, Corporation Office and I'd say to my program officer, it was Kevin, Kevin, we're, we're having trouble here. How do you want me to handle this? And usually Kevin would ask me lots of questions about what the problem was, 
what steps we had taken. And then usually Kevin would ask me what I want to do. Ryan, are you ready to terminate? And that usually made me think a little bit. Am I actually ready to terminate or was I just looking for some advice? And then where I was ready to terminate and I answered yes, then as long as all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, Kevin would start that process. Thanks for that, Ryan. So thanks all of you for all of your great questions. Um, at this point, we're going to move on to our open evaluation because we want to know what you thought. On the right side of your screen, you'll find a quick poll where you can share feedback about this webinar. So please take a moment to answer the questions. We like to be able to improve these webinars, so your input is definitely helpful to us. 